So now I'd like to turn this over to an avid gardener that many of you already know, fellow board member Suzanne Boren. Well, welcome, uh, fellow gardeners. Everybody's pretty intrepid. And uh, I know we have a lot of uh, experienced people here in the audience and a lot of people that are passionate about gardening, so uh, thank you. We've had such a good uh, response to this meeting that the program committee feels we'll probably do an annual meeting on gardens because it's one of the uh, greatest RSVPs we've had and you're very intrepid to come out in this weather. Uh, one of our other executive board members uh, last uh, month put on the program of the awards and he wanted me to put in a plug for the awards. We, uh, one of our functions and our mission is to uh, deliver awards to people in the community who have either done uh, preservation or excellence in infill or rehabilitation and also there's a category we have awarded for garden restoration. So uh, we gave uh, 11 awards last year and that brings us to 135 awards since 1991 and you can see these awards if in your newsletter. If you did not receive one, let us know at the membership table, we'll get you one. And also on our website, and there'll be a presentation to the City Council. Uh, so I just wanted to put that plug in, and uh, without any further ado, we'll turn the program over to Jane, who's on the program committee, and she'll introduce Craig. Thank you. Well, I'm particularly um, happy to introduce Craig Bergman. It was always uh, something I looked forward to every summer to when he had his um, retail garden in Winthrop Harbor. And I always went up and particularly liked to hear him talk about plants, which he did uh, on several occasions during the summer. And um, his plant food, uh, plant material was particularly uh, wonderful and I still have most of it in my garden. Craig Bergman is a registered landscape architect, garden designer, plantsman, and lecturer. His award-winning work has been featured on se in several books, including Rosemary Berry's The American Man's Garden, Paige Dickey's book Inside Out, Relating Garden to House, as well as in numerous gardens. Also, Craig and his own garden were featured on PBS television series, The Victory Garden, in 1998, HGTV, Gardner's Journal, and on the Garden Conservancy Tours, 1997 through 2006. Um, the 2007 January-February Garden Design Magazine features his Golden Trowel Award winning garden for a residential landscape in Highland Park, Illinois. Since 1982, Craig and his company, Craig Bergman Landscape Design Incorporated, have specialized in putting a Midwestern modern day twist on the classic garden designs of Europe. While best known for his herbaceous borders, potagers, woodland, and formal gardens, the scope of his work ranges from estate master planning, public and private urban gardens, sculpture gardens, and restoration of historic properties. Craig has been gardening for a long time, and it started on his fifth birthday when his father gave him a plot of uh, land behind the garage to have a garden, and he's been gardening ever since. So I welcome Craig Bergman. A lot of words. Uh, if you live long enough, I guess there's a story that uh, gets to be told about you. Uh, my dad is no longer with us, and uh, I think that one of the best things that he left for me and my family is not only his enthusiasm for gardening, but to know that there's things living past his life in the multiple houses that they lived in and I helped him garden in. So I, I occasionally will drive by and see an Arbor Day tree that we planted or I still have a cutting of uh, my grandmother's American Beauty rose, which came from Kankakee, Illinois. So there's, you know, there, there's something about living on and uh, respecting nature. I mean, I, I was a Ranger Rick kid. Uh, I was an Indian guide until it got too organized, and it uh, 
was, it just took too much time away from my playing in the woods and making forts and fishing and all that kind of thing. Uh, in college, I tried to study something that would keep my interest because I, I never really liked the organization of school. And I studied biology, and I have a degree in biology with a, with a minor in botany. I'm not a, a registered landscape architect through education. I'm grandfathered through the state of Illinois. I've never had a horticulture or landscape architecture uh, formal class before. I require my staff to, but I don't. Uh, <laughs> you know, all of the things that Jane was nice enough to, to list that we've been involved in, whether it's publication or, or uh, being on a, a television program or whatever, I couldn't do this without the team of people that I have behind me. I have, uh, over the years, I've had up to 100 employees. Uh, we're down to 75 now by choice. And uh, it's a dedicated group of people that are passionate about what we do. It's really wonderful to be able to love what you do and make a living doing it. And I hope that all of you, uh, whether you're retired or still working, love what you do because you're a fool if you don't. Um, I think I, I look pretty good for almost 50. Uh, I have a bad back because of my gardening. But uh, I just think that uh, life is too short and to live and breathe and eat something like work, like we all do, I just feel very fortunate to be able to, to make money doing it. So with that uh, sermon, I'm going to dive into this. One of the things that I did today was to focus my attention on properties that we've worked on that have been uh, where the house was built uh, either pre-1940 or brand new. And the reason I'm doing that is to kind of show you uh, how we can make old look uh, appropriate and how new can make uh, things look more established or older. I'm trying to, uh, with all of the work that we do, our best compliment is when somebody uh, pays the final bill and says, I, I can't believe that this is brand new. It looks like it's been here for a long time. And that's the point. I mean, if we're working on old established properties, we need to bring in a few big pieces of the puzzle if we're putting a new uh, collection of plants together. We have to use quality materials because typically the old homes were built with quality materials. Why would we want to lessen that? I think uh, the concrete paver will be one of the major elements of our landfills 20 years from now. When people who have uh, decided to do these quasi-cobblestone driveways realize that the color that they bought 10 years from now is going to be the color of concrete. You know, the, the fading factor of all of these, uh, these pseudo-materials, they're, they're not as good as the stone or the brick like these old houses uh, up here are made of. And it's just interesting. I mean, I think we'll see a real kind of turn in going back to the real materials. And what, what better way of going green than to use old street pavers? You know, you're not paying for that brick to be made again. You're not wasting fuel. We're actually just recycling. Unfortunately, it's expensive to do that, but sometimes that's a way of making a new property look uh, proper in these old neighborhoods, like most of my work is. We do a lot of planning. I thought uh, I'd just kind of show you what we're, what we're uh, up to now. Um, this is a project that we're working on on a creek in Downers Grove. Uh, I asked the, the client when I first met, the, met them and met their property, I said, what style is this house? And she said, well, it's a Cotswold cottage. Well, when you look at it, it has a terracotta roof, a terracotta tile roof, and uh, land and stone and brick detailing. And one of the most prominent features on the back of the house is this window. Yeah, as you can see, it's very kind of English arts and crafts in style. And I, I thought that it was quite a, a beautiful piece of architecture. And then I talked to the client and I said, well, how old is the house? And she said, well, this part, was built by Michael Graham of Lederbach and Graham about 15 years ago. So here is somebody that took an old house, put a new addition on it, and kept the same integrity uh, to the architecture as they did to the uh, house itself. And uh, I try to do that with landscapes. Uh, we, we tend to not rip everything out and start over. We use old pieces of the puzzle to rebuild a new puzzle. The, the sketches and the plans that you saw that I just kind of pass through is just to show you the, the technical uh, aspect of our work. We do need to plan. 
we do need to get drawings exact so then the, the work can be priced out, the budget can be approved, and then we can typically implement the project over a number of years. Uh, this job uh, is a nightmare. Um, we actually have very tight uh, space at both ends of the house, so we can't get plant materials in. So last week, during the last thunderstorm, we were lifting uh, 25 foot evergreen trees up and over the terracotta tile roof. I was a little nervous, but nothing fell. She wanted a pool. She lives in the floodplain, so we need to put the pool at the grade of the house. So the pool is uh, 22 steps above the grade of the backyard and the creek, which overflows twice a year. So it, it, this has been a real act of historic preservation, uh, both for home and landscape, because while we were at it, we shored up the foundation of the house so it wouldn't cave in with this new addition of the swimming pool. Uh, these light fixtures, uh, there's a great antique uh, light fixture company in uh, central Massachusetts that we found. Uh, we were able to buy a complete series of what are called, uh, they call them fiddlehead lanterns, like the fiddlehead fern frond as it's unfurling. We bought a whole set off of a house that had been demolished. So every lantern on the old house is coming to this new house, or this, this new location uh, for the, the different doors because she had a real mishmash of of, uh, of fixtures that she had purchased over the years, but now that we're trying to uh, connect all the dots and, and make one clean vision for the house, we tried to even influence her on outdoor fixtures and things like that. I have an opinion about everything. Sometimes people ask me, other times they just kind of volunteer. it. Uh, we do uh, historic public scale projects too. This is just a rendering of the Evanston Golf Club on Dempster, actually, it's weird. It's the Evanston Golf Club in Skokie. It's just because, you know, Skokie was uh, kind of wraps around Evanston, but, but we had to do a great big uh, pergola design and front entry and everything, and they, they've implemented about two thirds of it now. But it's, it was fun to be called in to do such a grand scale project. If any of you know uh, Ridge Road down in Evanston, stay tuned, because next month we'll be starting on this project uh, it's at the corner of Dempster and Ridge, uh, directly across the street from the old Eastman Mansion, that Georgian, that's on the west side. This is on the northeast corner. It's a beautiful, beautiful, again, arts and crafts style duplex. And over the course of five years, our client bought one half, and then the other half came on the market. They bought the other half, and they're combining it to be a single family house. Uh, it'll be 11 bedrooms, there's a, a 80 foot long ballroom in the top floor. And uh, when, you are, when you walk in at the street level, you walk up three steps. At that grade of the house, you have to walk down 15 steps to be down to the yard grade because Ridge Road is a ridge. So uh, we actually, with an architect, cooperatively designed a pair of uh, two car garages that help block the alley. And then there will be a central terrace that connects the two garages, connecting arbors and a lawn for the kids to play, and some interesting collections of plants. But, you know, when, when uh, we take on the responsibility of working on a project of this scale, uh, it, one, it costs a lot of money, and two, I'm designing it for somebody else, and I really want to make sure that what we're doing is, is doing what's appropriate for the house, but also doing what's appropriate for the client. And just, be, just because I may like something, I don't impose that on someone. But if I feel it's really important, I try to uh, convince. So. Uh, this was an interesting project for us. I'm going to buzz you through some completed projects so you can just see the, the diversity of styles of architecture that we've had to work with over the years. This is a brand new house four years ago. Uh, there was a wonderful uh, house on the property, unfortunately and three large Baroques that had to come down uh, to build this new house. Again, a Lederbach and Graham project. Michael Graham was the project architect. Uh, it's on uh, just shy of an acre of land, and the hope is that uh, about three years from now, when the neighbor's kids leave New Trier, they're, they're going to buy the neighboring property and, and add another parcel of land onto the, onto the property because as most houses happen these days, they're, they're building these behemoths on too small of a piece of ground. This, you know, this house should be on 1,000 acres. 
and uh, instead it's on an acre. So what we tried to do, we, we actually met the client and were hired prior to the demolition of the old house. And that's the best way to do it if you're going to be building in an old neighborhood on an old site, is to have the whole team hired before any holes are dug or any demos done. Uh, there, there are uh, seven remaining uh, mature trees on the property, three swamp white oaks, a big bur oak, a shagbark hickory, and an old silver maple. Since the house was built, we've taken down 11 trees. And when the house came down and the new foundation was put in, we took down three additional trees. The three trees we took down were huge baroques. It really, really made me sad. So I asked them before the, the final plans were approved by the city of Glencoe, I said, would you shrink the house? Just knock the billiard room off the house and we can save another oak. They said, but that's our access to the children's library. And I said, well, can't we do a s suspended stair or something? Well, everybody said no. So I said, OK. So I called a mill up in Wisconsin, and the three oaks got milled for all the landscape carpentry elements out in the landscape. So the pergola tops, the gates, uh, all of the, the wood detailing you'll see through the images are all from the trees that we, we had kiln dried and then uh, I cut into lumber for that work. I, I just couldn't see them dying for nothing. The house is uh, New York granite, uh, Cleveland quarry, uh, sandstone, and uh, limestone caps from Balder quarry, also in Ohio. Uh, the house is based on a design by Edwin Lutchens, uh, Little Thacum, which is actually in London. And if you've ever been there, the house is right on the road, so the, the front facade of the house is actually at the road, and then there's a big garden wall that you can't see anything up and over. The, the floor plan of the house is, is very interesting, and, and it helped inspire me to kind of keep in that arts and crafts uh, aesthetic. Uh, it's, I, I don't know how many folks uh, really know about the arts and crafts movement in, in England or have studied it, but it was all based on this communion between architecture and living inside and outside. And uh, it's fascinating to think kind of outside of the box sometimes when you're dealing with new construction because the nuances of an old house are often there and you just kind of uh, in, embellish them. With, uh, with a brand new house, you have to create the nuances from the get-go. So we were looking at the plans and suggested to put that little window in the chimney uh, the garden wall actually at the at the front entry. I don't have a pointer, so I'm going to point a couple things out. This here is a, a wellhead from China. There's quite a bit of detailing uh, that has real curvilinear lines, and that's where this path uh, design came from. The wellhead is new. We had a couple years to uh, acquire these materials because the the house took three years to build. And we actually accessorized the garden as we were planning the garden. So if we needed a garden ornament, we had a couple of years to find it. Um, and that's nice. Again, you know, there was the interior designer, the architect, and the landscape architect were all hired uh, pre-demolition of the old house. So we were able to have a real interplay. And it was a real collaboration. The stone entablature on the back, or the, the arbor that you see there, as you know, if you try to grow vines in the Chicagoland area, it takes a while for them to get root established for them to grow. So we went out into our woods up at the old nursery plot and cut old Concord grapes and uh, strangled the pillars and, the, and that heavy uh, stone beamwork with old grapevines and, and our new vines, which are wisteria and trumpet vine and sweet autumn clematis. They're now growing up the entablature, but uh, initially we wanted it to feel like there were old vines growing on it. The first Christmas, actually, this is a sidestep, but the first Christmas we covered all of the uh, grapevines with little white lights, and that was real beautiful, too. Uh, the lower level, you can see in the bottom right, uh, a, an odd little side story. The husband uh, of the couple who built this house, he lived in Northfield in, in a floodplain area, and every time it rained, his family's home basement would flood. So he said, we are not going to have a flooded basement in my new house. So there's like six different systems for this house not to flood. And his office and uh, their wine uh, tasting room is down in the, in essence, basement of this house. And there's massive amounts of uh, 
not just sump pumps, but drain tiles and systems that are, that are involved. But what I thought was really fun is that uh, even though it's basement, we created this, this well for this lower terrace. And from the main terrace, you walk down an iron stairway, uh, a spiral stairway to get down. But there's lots of ambient light. And the only plant material that the husband asked for was a couple of palm trees somewhere. So we call this his palm court. And you can imagine that these palm trees are heavy, and uh, they're only down in the summertime. So we found a, an old uh, uh, block and tackle that used to lift hay bales out of a barn. And we, in, we installed that on the iron railing to keep you from falling down into that sunken space. And we block and tackle the palm trees up and down in the fall and in the spring. Uh, that's always a challenge. It's kind of like our, our human crane scenario. But the ambient light down there is wonderful because it's bright, but it's also never full hot light. So uh, the, the stone gets kind of grungy and green, which makes everything look older. But it's a great microclimate for growing tropical species begonias. So we're up to, I think, 19 varieties of fancy leaf begonias that grow like weeds down here. And it's, it's almost like a, a greenhouse without a roof on it. So it's, it's a real fun place. And that's right off his office. Yeah, that gate actually is uh, from one of the great oaks that we had to take down. Um, and that's at the edge of the pool uh, garden, I would say. That little gate is only uh, three and a half feet tall. Uh, it's a six and a half foot wall because that's code for uh, as high as we could go. Uh, the detailing was lifted right out of an Edwin Lutyens garden wall. You can see the, the terracotta tile kind of uh, sunbursting off the arch. And I was at the Sandwich Antique uh, Fair years ago and found that keystone, which we incorporated. And it's from an old building in Iowa. The, the collection of spheres, uh, both animate or, or alive and not alive, uh, the stone spheres, the iron spheres, the boxwood spheres, uh, I had a pair of uh, stone columns that I, in the design that I wanted to have a, a pair of nice size balls on top. And the first balls I bought, I realized were too small. Then I found one big ball, and I thought, well, if I can find a mate for that, I'll have the right size balls for these piers. Well, I ended up with seven balls, and I'm looking at them all in the garage on top of pallets, and I said, I have a collection of spheres all of a sudden. So then I started looking for singles, and then, of course, when you look for singles, you find the pair that you're looking for. So I found a pair of cast iron uh, spheres that were just great, and we wax them so they don't get all the stone rusty. But we ended up with about 15 different spheres. Some look like cantaloupes, some look like smooths. I actually even bought some rock crystal uh, spheres. And they're all set in gravel. And then we, we carved the boxwoods into variable size spheres as well. And we ended up with a sphere garden. It's about 20 foot square. And uh, you can walk through. And uh, the wife, Jennifer, she called me when uh, they have four little boys. And she said, I, I got to tell you, I, I've been taking photographs all afternoon. My kids are running through the sphere garden and playing hide and seek. And she said, thank you, thank you, thank you. There's no sharp edges. And I, you know, it just kind of happened that way. And, I, and so that's one of those little details of the space. Uh, those, those stone obelisks you see, uh, they're from Scotland. They're about, they're about 300 years old. Uh, I found them at the uh, Navy Pier Flower Show. Uh, the, uh, the Chicago Botanic Garden had a display there the same year that we were doing I think, the, I think it was a secret garden when we did that. And I asked it who, they, who they had borrowed them from, because like all of us, if we have shows like this, we borrow props. We don't necessarily uh, buy them for ourselves. And uh, I, I was able to buy them from the dealer. Uh, the back hedge along the back property line, it would be the west property line, uh, we decided not to do a stone wall, one for economy, but also because all the views look out, we wanted to look at green, not at stone. So we, we put in a, a, a uh, Adams Columnaris U hedge, as tall as me from the get-go. So it covered up the stockade fence and then uh, buttressed the hedge. In other words, uh, at right angles, put shorter sections of hedge that look like a, a buttressed masonry wall. And then the, the wall around the pool, we buttressed with stone. So the same vocabulary of a wall uh, completely surrounds the house, but sometimes the wall is carved green, and other times it's this uh, New York granite. 
The uh, tunnel that you see is wrought iron, a local man, the Antari uh, is the name of the company there on the south side. They have some great craftsmen, and he did a lot of beautiful andiron work and fireplace screens and things inside the house, and I asked him if he'd do something for us on the outside. He was already doing the iron fence. There's a section of fence, one part of the yard. And I needed the fence uh, at the back of the garage to keep the kids off the driveway, keep the backyard fenced for the swimming pool that was in the backyard, and also screen the uh, concrete pavement of the driveway behind the, uh, where the garage doors and the basketball hoop was. So on a cocktail napkin one night, I thought, oh, that could be a tunnel. So uh, with Antari, we designed this tunnel, which is 45 feet long, and it's arched. And he had some old stock in his warehouse that had a, a instead of an embossed, it was actually a, a carved in uh, bark texture. And he said, I can bend this stock. It was two inch stock. And I said, well, if we're gonna do this tunnel, because I, I knew a, I wanted it covered with espaliered pear trees. And I have a man who grows espaliers for us. So the espaliers are grown with uh, the bottom lateral is 22 inches above grade. And then every two feet, he, he grows the vertical. So it looks like a giant dinner fork. That's the shape of the espalier we were putting on this tunnel. And we, we're growing the trees the same time as we were making the arbor, so we were able to, uh, when we installed it, it all looked like it, it had been grown for years that way. The branches and the leaves, uh, which we had him make out of iron, we attached to these arches, and then I went to Treasure Island and find a, found a couple of classic pears, and then we, we cast them in uh, sand, and then they were cast in bronze. So in the, in the wintertime, you see naked pear trees, with wrought iron leaves, branches, and pears. In the spring, you've got the wrought iron pears with the flowering pear, and in the fall, you get metal pears and real pears all at the same time. And uh, on the right-hand side, or the, or the driveway side of the tunnel, every two inches, there's a little picket, and that conforms to the Glencoe pool fence requirement. So we, we had a lot of things going on, and uh, it works as a screen. It works as an interest point, and if you're walking from that main terrace with the entablature, you walk down the tunnel, turn left, you're at the pool, turn right, you're on the drive. This should be a house that most folks know. Uh, it's a wonderful house. Bill and Lynn Redfield own it. Howard Van Doren Shaw. Uh, we have the nicest people to work for with the Redfields, and they're wonderful friends, too. Um, Bill's here, actually. Uh, the thing that I loved about this place is that I, I knew this house probably for 20 years before I was ever invited to come to it. And I always wondered what was in the backyard. Well, it's not the backyard that's spectacular here, it's the side yard. Uh, to the left of the main house, there's a wonderful sunken garden. And much to my uh, pleasure, when I met the property, it was kind of a dreary fall day. And uh, we were all in our, our wellies and our raincoats and we walked out. and. All of the infrastructural things, the masonry, the ponds, the pool equipment, the electrical, it was all done. Bill and Lynn had been working on restoring this garden, and now they were ready to talk plants. So all we had to do here was, in essence, decorate the garden, the, the foundation work, all of the difficult stuff, all of the ugly stuff was done already. And what was great for the budget is they'd already paid for it. So now, you know, we could, we could move right into planting. Uh, the, the house is uh, called the House of the Four Winds because it's never more than two rooms deep, so the wind uh, can pass through it, and it's on a knoll as well. If you've ever been to Crabtree Farm, the main house uh, that Adler built there for uh, William McCormick Blair, that's also that same narrow house form, too. It's pre-air conditioning, so they needed to do what they could to uh, catch a breeze when they could. The, the garden here, uh, if one was to go out the south side of the house, there's a covered porch where the master bedroom's up above uh, the covered porch, and then there's a, a long canal that then drains over a landing of a double stairway that then falls into another canal that goes to a sunken garden space. Just a spectacular, spectacular place. Uh, big lawn on the east and the west side of the sunken garden, 
And one of the things that we did straight away was remove some pear trees that were flanking the upper canal because in essence they block that, that open, open uh, uh, ceiling space. We needed the consistency of the lawn to be able to run through when you're standing on the porch to realize that you're going into a private little space amongst this beautiful big lawn. And uh, the ceiling detailing is the sky. Uh, the color scheme of the garden uh, was determined by, uh, I don't know, I don't remember whether it was Bill or Lynn's, I think it was Bill's uh, mother uh, for their wedding present, did a cruel embroidery for the canopy of their canopy bed. And the color scheme was blue and purple and burgundy on uh, cream linen. And that's the color scheme of their bedroom. And this sunken garden looks out onto that uh, garden. So that was our color scheme. And uh, what better accessory for a garden than a blue sky? And it, and it went with the color scheme too. So we were able to just really capitalize on the reflective quality of, of the sky in the water. And the sky color was one of the sky blue tones of the flowers that we used in the upper terrace garden. Uh, we use a lot of, on the upper terrace garden, there's no fence, there's no enclosure to keep deer out. So we needed to use all types of plants that the deer wouldn't munch on. and wouldn't be potentially attracted to to then decide to go down the stairs into the sunken space. So we used uh, Russian sage, salvias, calamintha, lamb's ears, uh, caryopteris, boxwood, uh, all things that you can grow if you have a deer problem. Typically something that smells uh, minty or, or has a noxious smell, the deer tend not to eat. And uh, that's just kind of a cue for you. Uh, the garden is not intended to be a, a year-round garden. Of course, it's pretty in the winter, but it, it started blooming about two weeks ago, and now it will go until Thanksgiving. But we don't put the pressure of spring on the garden because they have so much space, and uh, there's other areas that we can focus on spring. Here's the... Uh, the upper image is the upper canal looking south, and at the, the bottom image is the, the lower canal. Uh, with It's in full bloom right now. It's, well, actually, it's not in full bloom. It's just starting to be in bloom. There's catmint on both sides. It's the blue, the haze. And uh, as you know, we're behind this year. I mean, we're, we had a nice spring. Uh, I was over on Lake Road this week, and there were still tulips blooming. So it, it's pretty exciting. I mean, I, I, I like that we've had a spring this year. Uh, the garden uh, is terminated with a beautiful uh, arced uh, land and stone wall with a, a big old bench. And at the end of the bench, we always just have uh, two big tubs of blue hydrangea at the back. And at that, that little terrace, a year after we initially uh, started planning, Bill and Lynn and I opened a bottle of Dom Perignon and toasted the garden. That was, that was a real, that was the nicest thing that any client has ever done for me. It was wonderful. <laughs> Well, besides paying the bill. <laughs> Here's that color scheme of the bedroom. Uh, high summer. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk so much about each property, but I, I love the red fields, so I talk a lot about their garden. Uh, using Casablanca lilies at the, at the top of the garden, if you're lucky enough to be there, uh, because the garden's sunken, because there's water, uh, the humidity just uh, permeates the the air in that whole sunken garden when the Casablancas are blooming. Uh, off to the, the east side of the lower garden is a, what we call the stroll garden. And it, in essence, is a, a long uh, turf space that has little branches that if you were to look at it in a drawing, it almost looks like a hyacinth and bud. There's a stem and then alternate little circular spaces that, that uh, veer off. At the end, as you can see, we've uh, put a, a hedge of Cornelian cherry in that uh, has an arc top. There's a lot of arcs and curves in the architecture and in the garden. And uh, originally, this house probably owned more property. So that hedge is the edge of the property line, but the trees beyond belong to the neighbor. So we're, by putting that extra hedge in, it helps the property look like it goes on a little further. The little sculpture that you see, it's a, a bronze of a, a boy uh, making a pot on a potter's wheel. He's now up on a, a pedestal. We did the pedestal last year. We found some old stone behind the old wall and had just enough to build a pedestal for him. And that came with the house when Bill and Lynn bought the house, which was cool. Here's a wonderful old house in Hinsdale. 
Uh, John and Ann Gruby have been clients of mine since uh, 1985. The house was built by one of the original founders of the uh, board of, uh, mercantile, of the Mercantile Exchange down uh, in Chicago. And when they started uh, building the, the bank buildings and the real business core of Chicago after the fire, after a while they had to redo all the electrical and the sewer system in that stretch. So all of the brick paved streets were lifted and hauled away to the dump. Well, this man had most of the brick hauled away to Hinsdale. And he built his house out of old street brick. The driveway, circle driveway is street brick. And there's a five foot wall all around a half acre backyard that's also of street brick. The, the roof itself is terracotta tile. All of the Tudor detailing that you see, the, the carved uh, elements on the house are salvaged from houses in England and the front door of this house is a door of a 13th century abbey. It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful old house in one of those numbered streets in Hinsdale. You know, it's on 6th Street. Uh, again, this, this uh, garden had a long rill or a canal, and when I met the property, that canal was filled with red wax begonias. It was very bizarre. The, the Groobies had not purchased the house at that point. They did not plant the begonias. Uh, they had collected for years English antiques and really loved the English style of the house. And they are just moving from, from their old house, they moved a block down the street. They always wanted this house, and when it came on the market, they did it. Uh, there was no garden, but there was a, a skeleton of a garden. There was a rectilinear sunken space. Again, the wall was defined by old street brick. And a couple of steps down, and two beautiful uh, glazed terracotta jars. So I, I had the space, I had where the canal once was, and I had the, the uh, style of the house just said, we need an English garden here. So what we did was uh, we brought in a few more old street pavers and put a path down in the sunken garden space because originally it was just lawn. And when you put a garden in like this, you need to maintain it. And us coming up and down those stairs and walking on the turf twice a week would not, uh, the turf wouldn't survive all of that. So we put a little walking path in in the lower garden, uh, reactivated the canal by having, uh, we lifted all the old stone coping off, put all new concrete in, and then put the old coping back on so it didn't look like it was a new canal. Put the waterfall back in at the end, and uh, then we actually uh, restored the uh, kitchen garden, which is along the coach house on your right. Those arches are uh, uh, an addition to the garden that we put on. And the walkway was there. We just uh, lifted the, the bricks that had sunken. And because this is from, this is the view of the garden that they would see from their family room, we made sure that we incorporated a lot of carved box wood and things so they'd have something to look at in the winter as well. Uh, this is a wonderful place here in Lake Forest. Uh, it was once a coach house to a, a grand house. And uh, when our clients bought the the house years ago, they converted it into a single family home. The front door, as you can see, uh, has a, with a wonderful open stone arch, and there at one point was three of those arches where the uh, carriages and the horses used to be able to go through. There's now just the one. Uh, you can see that the architecture is very charming. It, it came with the turret, it had a beautiful uh, copper and uh, slate roof. and. It had the typical traditional U hedges across the front foundation of the house. First thing I did was asked if I could remove the foundation planning and put the gravel right up to the building. The, this house does not face the street. It actually is in the back corner of, an, of a big old parcel of land. So there was no keeping up with the Joneses or having to worry about curb appeal or whatever. We just did what the architecture uh, required, which was take the plants away so you can see it. Uh, it's, this house looks very much like it might have been uh, a story higher, and it's sunken. I mean, it, it always, to me, has looked like it's, it's a, a little chunky for its roof. And uh, by taking away the foundation plantings, in essence, uh, we were able to make it look a little bit taller. We had the, the wood boxes made, and then just, uh, this is how you see it. The seasonal quality comes from an old iron urn that we put uh, to the left of the front door there. The stone piers uh, are new. Uh, we uh, took the lentil detailing of the house and just uh, put it right on the piers. 
And the building to the left is actually a brand new coach house. There's actually an office upstairs, and then that's where their garage is. When you convert a coach house, you no longer have a garage. When they bought the property, it just had a little shed. It was an outbuilding that they painted dark green, and it kind of listed to one side, and it fit the Fiat. That's all it fit. So they, they lived in the house for over a decade and decided to uh, do, a, do a proper building for it. So they hired Tom Rakovich, who's a wonderful architect, very, very sensitive to historic uh, architecture. On the back side of the coach house, you can see there's a little, in essence, a little projection. That's the garden shed. Um, that said to me, hollyhocks. So there's always hollyhocks there. And then we grow clematis up and over uh, on that roof. So there's always a clematis clamoring on top. The, the back of the, the property, which is what you're looking at now, was once an orchard for the estate. So what we did was we put in, and we imposed a grid of trees and then I looked at it in plan and anticipated which ones might have died over the years. So it, we could have planned, to, planned a perfect square of trees, but in essence, instead of planting 25, we planted 11 just by plucking out. So if you were to superimpose the, the organization of the, of, the, of the orchard, you could see that um, there's a grid there, but not all the pieces are there. Uh, we also put daffodils out in the turf and put old shrub roses. Uh, so in essence, in the spring, there's a kind of a country vista out from the living room, which are the windows of the, the main house that you can see. And we promised them that we would not kill the bur oak through all of our, our landscape construction, and we didn't. On the back side of the house, there was a big concrete slab that ran per perpendicular to the back of the house. And I asked what that was about, and, and uh, Mrs. Linville said to me, uh, well, there was once an old greenhouse for the estate on the back of the stable. So she said, what are we going to do with that? And I said, we're going to clad it in bluestone and make it your patio. Uh, the, the back property line is, in essence, a ravine, and we constructed that wisteria arbor that you can see in the, the upper left image. And uh, that, in essence, provides us windows out to the ravine view. But more importantly, it provides a backdrop for us to then focus our furniture out to the garden and then out into that old orchard space. Uh, there's four lilac standards in the sunken garden space. It was not sunken before. It was at the same level as the slab was. So we wanted to get some topographic interest and change. Uh, David Linville had a rose garden there and a lot of the roses were dear to him. So pre-construction, we dug them all up, brought them to our nursery and then brought them back after uh, the, the new rose garden was constructed. Uh, this upper little terrace at the, at the uh, bottom image, if you were to typically do a, a parterre or a decorative uh, garden with boxwood, you would more than likely do a band of boxwood and plant frilly things inside. This house is not a frilly house. It needed something that was referential to the old style of gardens, but I wanted to do something a little bit more uh, interesting. So our narrow bands are the bluestone, and the infilled green spaces are just panels of boxwood. So it just makes for a, a little pattern change and it gives us a little bit more winter permanence because if you have a rose garden that you look out at in the winter time, it's but ugly. So by having this boxwood parterre at the upper level at your main view and the four uh, lilac standards that we typically put little white lights on at holiday time, it makes for a real pretty little magical space even when it's not growing. Here's a great old house that was once about twice as large as it is today, but due to fires and everything, it um, is its own structure right now. Uh, it's on County Line Road. Uh, these folks are wonderful. Every time a tangent property comes up, they buy it, knock the house down, and make more garden. Uh, it's somebody that's truly trying to green Hinsdale back. If you've been to Hinsdale lately, you'll be disappointed. There's so much bad architecture going up. And then there's, in essence, no preservation happening. This garden, uh, we had a lot of challenges for it. One, it's heavy clay soil. Two, uh, it's an old parcel and you can't get heavy equipment anywhere because the property lines are so tight and there's so many big old trees that we have to wheel everything in by hand. Luckily, the old pool was there and we just had to resurface it. 
but these borders, these, uh, there's a pair of herbaceous borders of the pool, and uh, our clients go away for the months of July and August. If you garden in northern Illinois, your bulk of your color and display is in July and August and September, right? So we have to have these gardens bloom as quick as they can in April and May, kind of wane down by the end of June and start back up again in September when they get home. So it's a challenge when, when they want perennials because they don't want it to look like an annual garden. And uh, when, when you have weather doing what it's doing now, I mean, I have a feeling they're, because they're far enough west, you know, they're not as far behind as we are. But uh, to, to have a peony last for more than three days when we have weather like we did this morning, I mean, it's hard. You know, so, so we're always uh, challenged to keep our, our plant collection accurate for, for the timing. Real simple. I mean, if you've ever uh, had to restore a swimming pool, we don't live in California. We don't need turquoise pools. Um, just say no to white plaster. Um, you, can, you can make a pool look much more elegant if you have it hand plastered with something gray. Or a lot of times people will say, oh, I don't like a black pool because it looks like, you know, I can't, nobody's going to be able to see the bottom, whatever. If you do this mottled gray, it almost looks like the whole pool is clad in bluestone, and it makes it look old. A great old place in, in Winneka. This house has a wonderful story. It was being constructed on, in the complete, almost completed, uh, when the stock market crashed. And this man that, was, that built this house uh, lost everything. He was building a getaway house. They lived on East Lakeshore Drive, and they were, they were building a weekend place. It was the first house to be built on Indian Hill Country Club. And it was for ballet concerts and choral concerts. And their, their living room was 40 by 80 feet. The kitchen was in the basement. And there were two bedrooms, one for the daughter and one for mom and dad. That's how this house was constructed. It sat vacant after the stock market crash for 20 years, and then one family uh, lived in it for another 20 years that didn't do anything to the floor plan. They kept the kitchen in the basement. Um, there was a couple of kids, but they shared the bedroom, and there was a library on the first floor they converted to a bedroom. Well, our clients uh, had just finished renovating a house less than a block away, and they always said to each other when they walked around the country club grounds, they said, the only house we'd ever move from our house to, if it ever comes to the market, is this house. And they just finished their renovation, and this house went on the market, and they bought it. Six months into the renovation, she was diagnosed with leukemia, and she spent two years in the hospital. And they have five kids. And so uh, his mom and dad moved in with them, and they were under construction and renovation on this house. The, the whole big long-winded story of this is she's fine, she's playing tennis, they've, uh, they've got three dogs, uh, first kids in college, everybody's fine. And uh, it's a success story because I, th I think this house had a, had a hard start, but when somebody moved in that uh, loved it and needed the love of that house, uh, this old house really came through for the family. One of the great things about this property is that it's, it's a big old house set way far on the west edge of the property. And there's two and a half acres of, in essence, parkland that's theirs with an interesting little garage at the top of, a, top of the two and a half acres. When they bought the property, they said that they, they wanted to put a swimming pool right outside their new porch. And I said, no, you're not going to do that because you're going to drive by it every day and half the year it's covered. Why don't we tuck it behind some gardens into the side of the hill? So we built this uh, little pool house and did the herbaceous borders that you see, all nestled in amongst the base of a big grove of Norway spruce that were there. We obviously didn't plant. That railing detail came from uh, Dan Gill's uh, father's, uh, mother and father's home where he grew up in Rochester, New York. It was the banister detailing in their old house. And it didn't really go with the architecture, but he said, can we have it somewhere? So they ended up ripping out the iron railings that were in the old house, put it in, in this house, and then I said, well, let's just follow it through and put it on the outside as well. All the, all the walls and bricks that you see, we actually pulled off of the old house. They added on the screen porch, 
and then they were reclad back on. Uh, there was an old retaining wall that we also recycled all the stone on before. And when you're at the pool patio, this is the view of the house that you look back to. Sometimes my job is to preserve the integrity of the site more than complement the architecture of the home. Uh, we were hired by a friend of ours uh, uh, just a few years ago who was building an, uh, a farm from scratch. He bought a beautiful 60-acre parcel of rolling farmland in Buchanan, Michigan. And he decided he wanted to have an orchard, and this would be his weekend house. Uh, he intentionally designed the house himself to look as if it was an old farmhouse that had been added on to a, a bunch of times. And he wanted it white, he wanted a green roof, he was very particular about it. And uh, he was the designer uh, of the house, which is interesting. How often do we actually get to design our own homes? We usually have an architect to do that or it's already built. Uh, the little building that you see on the bottom left is a 10 by 10 uh, woodshed that I told him he had to build because he had, he had the house and then he had the garage. And we needed a way of defining uh, an entry space. You know, when, you're, when you're driving up a, a gravel road up through all these acres, you need to organize the space. And if you ever look at uh, how farms are, are laid out, they're always laid out in a very common sense kind of way. The house is far enough away from the barn so you don't smell it. It's downwind from the house so you don't smell it. But it's close enough in the wintertime you don't have to shovel a long way to get to it. The chicken coop is always closer to the kitchen because that's where you need the eggs in the morning. And the, and the wood shed is always close to the door that you would load the, the stove with or the fireplaces or whatever. There's some real, if you look at the, the logic of how a farm is organized, you, you can actually translate that to uh, particularly early American architecture. Um, I, I have a, a, a pair of dear friends that have a beautiful house that was built in 1620 in Sussex in England. And it was once a, a family home in this little village. And the livestock lived on the first floor and their living area was up above. And it's because the composting grain in the cow's bodies they, they, uh, when they compost, as, as you know, with your compost pile, it steams and it heats up. Those, those mammals would heat the house with, in, in combination with fire, and that's how people kept warm in the 1600s. You know, they, they were using those warm cows as part of their heating systems. I, I think that's really wonderful stuff. Uh, that was an agrarian side stuff. So when you have a beautiful site like this, uh, I think less is more. And uh, he wanted a pool, so he just did a simple rectangular pool because, as you see, the, there's lots of open land, so there's always crud that's going to blow into the pool. So we wanted to have an automatic cover. It's also for security since he's not here uh, all, all week long. The pool has a very narrow pool deck. It would be non-conforming for Lake Forest because you have to have 36 inches from water edge to the back of, of uh, the deck. But uh, here we could do something real skinny. And uh, we put an arbor over the, the little uh, shack that looks like a tool shed that's actually the pool house. So we were able to put all the equipment in one half and a changing room and a bathroom in the other. And the door is actually a sliding barn door uh, to just kind of keep this agrarian thing going. The arbor in front of this little pool house are old salvage beams that we got from a factory and then we're training uh, wisteria up and over it. If you ever want to grow blooming wisteria, grow Kentucky wisteria. It's uh, wisteria macrostachy. There, there's a real common variety named Ant D. There's also one just out this year called Biltmore that actually was from cuttings from, uh, from Biltmore in Asheville. But uh, it is the wisteria that leafs out first and then blooms in June, as distinct from uh, frost, being frostbit, like our magnolias get in the spring before the leaves come out. Uh, the Japanese and the Chinese wisterias are, are, are a real gamble if you're going to try to get them to bloom in our climate because our, uh, our winter is much longer than, say, the Pacific Northwest or the East Coast when it comes, and, and it's much more volatile. Our spring is much more volatile. We have uh, freezing temperatures, all as we know, all the way through the end of May. So Kentucky wisteria is a great, uh, great way of uh, growing. And even over in Michigan, where you can grow the Asian wisterias, he's on top of a hill here. We wanted it to succeed. We didn't want it to sometimes bloom. We wanted it to always bloom. The little scree garden or the gravel that you see uh, there, 
uh, we planted a few verbascums and euphorbias and uh, just let them seed in as they will. So it looks as if maybe some of the meadow flowers had seeded into the gravel. The, the ornamental grasses are actually Calamagrostis, Carl Forrester, feather reed grass. We just did a long rectilinear panel of it and you look through those grass heads when you're sitting on the screen porch out to the pool just for a little diffusion of the pool. A great uh, old kind of antebellum style house. It almost feels like Tara as you're driving up to this house. It's uh, off a hill road in Winneka. Uh, the odd thing about this property is that being at the end of a, a dead end road, there's no place for guests to park unless you park on the property. So we needed to create a motor court that was sensitive to the architecture and be able to house 15 cars. Uh, it's a big old house, therefore they have big old parties. And uh, we needed to do something that was sensitive to the, to the site, but functional and practical. So we brought in old street pavers and instead of going to the uh, financial effort or the maintenance effort of gravel, we just did blacktop because this, uh, the way that this house was built, as I'm sure a lot of your homes are, if you live in old homes, uh, you live out the, the back of the house. You don't necessarily live out the front. You know, the, the, the living room faces the front court, but the house is up a few steps. The floor of the main house is up about four steps. So uh, you don't, you're not looking at a parked car all the time. It's nice when, you, when, as a landscape professional, you can know what's going on inside the house and what the views are outside so you know where to put the parked car or where to put the garbage cans or, or where to put the, the ugly things, the air conditioners, the generator, whatever, because you don't want to put them somewhere where you're going to see them all the time, obviously. Uh, there was a little playhouse that uh, we ended up uh, converting over to what we would call like a little shed uh, with a kitchen garden. We put the, the fence around uh, the garden. There are deer here on the property, uh, so every once in a while they'll, they'll reach over. But uh, we, it is a rabbit-proof fence. We, it looks like a picket fence, but then there's hardware cloth behind the pickets just to keep uh, the little vermin out anyways. Uh, the, Again, this old house at one point had an orchard. We found a few stumps that were on 15-foot center. So we, we traced where the stumps were, dug out the, the old wood. It was all rotted. And we put in a crab, or, a crab Donald Wyman flowering crab apple orchard. So in the spring, uh, right off the garage, you have uh, nine matching Donald Wymans blooming with this urn on axis through that little skinny gateway that you can see from the front door. If you were to walk in the front, door of this house, you walk into the entry hall and you can look straight through it, through the, the little screen porch that you can see in the bottom right, and uh, all the way back to a wonderful old tank that they never used. It was like an old uh, fountain area that had just, uh, these people have lived in this house for over 30 years and they just never, they never thought to do anything with it. So we restored it, we bought this new basin and pedestal and uh, got it active again and uh, that uh, triage in the, in the background is painted a, a real dark green uh, because as you can see those evergreen trees don't have any bottom branches. The property is contained on two sides by stockade fencing but who wants to look at old trees and then stockade fence with a formal garden in the foreground. So the triage helps diffuse the view of the fence and keeps us from having to plant underneath the roots of those mature hemlock uh, because if we had planted underneath the hemlock, we probably would have killed them by putting in the new evergreens that would have filled that gap. So we had to do it with carpentry. We were lucky enough to uh, restore a landscape for a, a Frank Lloyd Wright house on Forest in Oak Park last year. And uh, we had the original concept drawings of the landscape uh, that Wright had done. And uh, this home actually has the original parcel except the, the furthest east land which was actually sold off to the neighbor and they cooperatively share in the maintenance of it now. But the house is set on uh, one lot and the garden is on the other lot. And this is how uh, Wright intended it from the first get-go. And as any landscape uh, is, you can kind of see where people have plunked a tree here, plunked a tree there. And, and they weren't necessarily sensitive to it being a right house. A lot of times, uh, particularly uh, between the, I'd say the, the 50s and the 80s, people that owned right houses, they were just kind of repairing them 
to shore them up, but they didn't really honor them like they're honored now. Um, they, they, yes, they were important to Midwestern architecture, but they were a lot of money to keep up. I mean, the technology that Wright used when building this house is, was the most modern technology of the time. But when you think that this house, you know, with all these modern details, was built in 1902, I mean, the, the steel that suspends these overhangs and things was not the steel strength that we have today. So if it ever got any moisture to it, it started rusting. So there's a lot of repair work on these old places. And it's inside and out. These folks really loved the house. They moved from one right house to another. And this house, they said, let's do what's appropriate. So the foundation planting would not be to many of your, you folks liking. We actually brought Midwestern native plants to the front door. Uh, the, the planters that are built into the house, instead of putting the ubiquitous geraniums and dracaena spikes that you'd see, you know, a lot of times in any of these built-in planters in old houses, uh, we actually are growing uh, native woodbine and sedges uh, which are a, a, a grass that grows in the woods in the shade. And so everything about this landscape was to set it into the prairie plants that Wright had intended it to be in. And one of the nice things is, is that the, the edges had enough seedling, sugar maples and things, and there are even a few old arrowwood viburnum and the like, so we, we could tell what the original plant matrix was. And we watched it over the course of a six month period, so we could just add things that we saw were original and bulk up the numbers. And uh, so it ends up being a real kind of a cross between a, a woodland garden in the shade and a prairie garden in the sun. And uh, it needs a couple of years to settle in, but I think Frank would have been happy. This is the garden we're gonna try to go see um, if the weather holds for us. Uh, how many folks brought their wellies? Umbrellas? How many folks here garden? Excellent, how many don't? How many want to? Okay. Uh, this is a wonderful house. Uh, I don't know if you've ever met any of the Drake family, but it's uh, Charrington Drake's house. Uh, it's on Mayflower Road. Uh, it was built uh, for Alfred Baker and his wife in 1895. The house took a couple years to build. Uh, Charrington thinks that it is the first residential commission that uh, Howard Van Doren Shaw had in Lake Forest because there's not much documentation on the house. Uh, it's fully clabbered. There are masonry foundations and, and uh, chimneys, but it's a real pretty house. And if you know Shaw's architecture, it's very interesting to see how, how eclectic he was. I mean, this is very much a Georgian American styled house. Make sure that when you're there, look at the, the overhang of the dental moldings, they look like giant Lego blocks. They're really great. Um, I, I would never want to pay for the painting of this house because there's so much detail in molding. Uh, the house right now is, a, is was just, it's, I don't know if it's finished, but she's been painting it this spring. And it's a little brighter yellow than it was in these pictures. Uh, when she bought the house, it had been owned by the Smith family for 25 years and it was charcoal gray and the shutters were off the house. And the only, the, and you couldn't see any of the, the uh, molding details. It was a modernist approach to this old house. What you see, what you'll see today is the white trim, the black shutters, the, the yellow clabbered. Imagine everything charcoal gray. It, it with a red terracotta tiled roof, or a red slate roof. Um, very peculiar. It was the minimalist period and the Smiths had a fabulous modern art collection and they used the, the old shell of the house as their, as their gallery space for their art collection. Uh, interestingly, uh, Charrington's family is the uh, fourth owner of the house, and each one of the uh, owners has lived in the house uh, somewhere around 25 years. Uh, Charrington's been here for 14, and she's planning on being here for 35 years. Uh, when, again, when they bought the house, uh, the coach house is out far away from the house, about three quarters of an acre away. She thinks that it's not the original coach house, but um, the original coach house was probably in the same location as that garage. So what uh, she did was hired a Philadelphia architect who was very well read in Shaw architecture to design this garage that they didn't attach right to the structure, but they actually put a covered walkway to connect the garage to the house, and, and I think you'll see that it's, it's quite sensitively done. Uh, 
that rose arch will not be in bloom in front of the garage today, but that's uh, good old William Baffin, the best climber we can grow. What we inherited to work with Sherrington on was a walled garden space that was uh, claimed to be done by El Ellen Biddle Shipman in uh, 19, I think it was 1941, something like that. Um, the wall in one crab tree and an old uh, fountain, a rectilinear fountain or pond, were the only things remaining in the in the landscape, and there are no drawings for us to use as referential. Uh, I showed you the pictures of the Redfield Garden. We had the old scheme drawings and the concept drawings. Bill and Lynn had really done a lot of hard work to find them, and uh, we were able to use those as reference for not a, not a restoration, but a renovation sensitive to the original collection of plants that were in the garden. In, in this garden, uh, our charge was really uh, to provide a, a great, beautiful, appropriate garden space for the walled space and provide as many woody uh, plants, trees and shrubs, so there could be a really great collection of plants because Charrington has a degree in botany and she loves woody plants. Perennials are fine, but she'd rather have a tree or a shrub. And uh, so hopefully we'll be able to see a good bit of this uh, if we don't get poured on. When I get to work on these old places, this is actually on the, the porch at uh, at Little Orchard, which is the name of the original house. Um, I feel very honored, and uh, it's very important to me to not only respect the, the person I'm working for, but to respect the property that I'm working on. Uh, these old elements, whether it be an old wall or an old tree, uh, sometimes it's even something we dig up when we dig a hole, um, a, a fragment of architecture, or an old garden ornament or something. I feel like it's kind of like archaeology. There's always something that I take home uh, that's mine. It's not that I'm taking an object, but I'm taking an experience. And uh, if any of you understand uh, what I'm saying, you'll realize that a new garden is wonderful, but a, a garden a couple of years older is better. And uh, typically, we have some type of maintenance connection to the garden. Uh, I just lost the first garden that I ever installed to uh, the sale of the house and the people that bought the house are going to subdivide the property. But I, I had worked on that garden for 29 years and I watched kids grow up, first communions on the patio, wedding tent, funerals, um, traditional uh, trees being planted to commemorate a 25th anniversary. You know, I experience all these things. You know, when, when you're working with somebody's home, you know, if you're, a, if you're a, uh, an architect or an interior designer, um, you tend to do the work and you leave it. And if you're lucky enough, you keep the relationship going if you're gonna add onto the house or change style or whatever. But when you're dealing with perishable goods like plant materials, it's really important to to keep the intention going. And that's, that's what our job is, is to, to educate our, our client to understand that, okay, this can be a beautiful garden, but with the garden comes the care that goes along with it. I would never want to design something that would fall apart due to lack of care. I would say 99% of the projects that we do, when the houses sell, we don't keep the maintenance. And it's because the people weren't as invested in it that bought it as the people that paid for it and grew the garden with us over the years. So the, this particular garden um, we installed 10 years ago now. And uh, we, you know, I have Charrington's cell number, she has my cell number, you know, what do you think of this? I'm at Lurby's, I'm at Chalet, I'm at Fiori, whatever. We have a constant conversation. It's a creative process that I'm, I'm lucky enough to share with these folks. And uh, I just, wish that you find things like that in your life to share because this is these are my children, all these gardens. And uh, I, I'm not lucky enough to have kids, but they sure are uh, giving me a lot of joy and making a lot of beautiful things. So let's go. Let's go to Little Orchard.